Hey everyone and happy Monday. I first want to say happy Nurses Week. I am so excited to be with all of you here tonight. Um, and we have an excellent guest for you all today. But first, I'd like to bring on my co-host, Captain Brandon Parham. Hey, Holly. Hey, Brandon. How are you doing? I'm great. Happy Monday. Happy late Mother's Day. Oh, and thank you. happy Mother's Day to everyone out there. Um, happy Nurses Week. Thank you so much. I am so pumped that we are celebrating um, this amazing Nurses Week with just a truly amazing guest. Um, he has a lot of different great career experiences, is an ICU nurse um, in the Army, and we're just really excited just to get to chat with him and learn more about opportunities as a critical care nurse. Yeah, I agree. I'm super excited about this as well to learn more about nursing and especially uh, ICU nursing. Awesome. All right. Well, let's do this. Awesome. Well, welcome. This is Major Drake Carter, our esteemed guest. He is an ICU nurse on active duty in the Army, and we're going to let him kind of tell his story, but I actually met Major Carter last year when he was attending CGSC. We met up and had a lunch with all the Army nurses, um, and that was a really cool opportunity kind of just to learn about CGSC, but also get to meet some fellow Nurse Corps officers. So we are so happy that you're here with us today, Major Carter. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, Holly. Thanks, Brandon, for inviting me on here. Um, happy Nurses Week. Happy Monday, of course. And uh, thanks for just having me on. And uh, welcome to all of our virtual guests, of course. So I'm super excited to uh, be able to at least share a little bit of my story. Um, Pretty, pretty traditional, I guess you could say, in the sense that uh, I was a ROTC student um, at Tennessee Tech University. And through that, I, I had an, a specific Army ROTC nursing scholarship. Um, so no other prior Army experience, no other um, uh, real Army aspirations outside of just uh, doing my initial ROTC, uh, becoming a nurse. And then, you know, we, we went, I went from there. So uh, coming right out of... Uh, of nursing school, I commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army, um, was able to be a gold bar recruiter uh, for my um, school, my own school, Tennessee Tech, uh, for the first three and a half, four months uh, while I was waiting to attend Bullock uh, basic officer course. And uh, once, once I uh, went to basic officer course, completed that, my first duty assignment was at Eisenhower Army Medical Center in Fort Gordon, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia. A uh, great uh, initial place for, for the start of my nursing career, at least. Served as a 66 hotel for three years, uh, working in the telemetry ward as well as the progressive care floor. Uh, got all my basic, you know, staff nursing time. Um, did my CNTP, clinical nurse transition program time there. And uh, was able to apply to the ICU 66 Sierra critical care course. Uh, the critical care course is a joint course combined uh, for ICU and ER nurses. Um, they put all the didactic teams together and uh, then you split clinically whenever you go through the course. So uh, for myself, I think it was right around three and a half to four months long of uh, really, really intense uh, didactic work uh, followed by the clinicals where you get out, you, they, they uh, you know, test your knowledge, of course, on the floors with your patients. You, you get all these patients that you uh, learn about with pre- pre-planning kind of like you did in nursing school, just at a, you know, more advanced level as far as the, the labs and the, the pathology, stuff like that. Uh, so uh, following that, uh, finally graduated the critical care course in uh, February of 2014. And my first intensive care unit assignment was at Triple R Army Medical Center in Honolulu. Uh, great, great place to learn how to be an ICU nurse. And I say that because uh, Specifically, they have an everything ICU. It's just one ICU. I think it's around 16 beds or so. Uh, but as opposed to, uh, for example, uh, BAMSI, where there's a medical ICU, a surgical ICU, 
a neuro ICU. Uh, Tripler uh, just had a singular one ICU. So we were the catch all. And um, for me, that really broadened my horizons because I was able to to really be the jack of all trades. We might get a neuro patient. We might get a trauma patient. Uh, we certainly got a lot, a lot of um, surgery patients. They were a big cardiothoracic program. So, um, and then uh, as as I experienced in critical care nursing, uh, specifically there, we I was allowed to join the rapid response team. So uh, they they put uh, seasoned ICU nurses uh, as the singular responder to uh, any nurse that needs assistance out on the floors, or if uh, there are patients on the floors that their parameters just might not look well enough for the floors. They might ask for a second opinion. We'd go check them out and uh, either assist with the, the staff to help get our, their hemodynamics a little bit more stable, or we'd uh, advise the docs to hopefully uh, send them to the ICU if that was the case. So I was able to do that for about two years. Um, but yeah, my, my experience at, at Tripler was just fantastic. Got to to really see the, the whole spectrum of ICU nurses uh, with everything, with maybe the exception of like transplant and stuff like that, but uh, was able to do the the really cool cool stuff: CRT, cardiothoracic surgeries, uh, tons of hemodynamic instability, uh, drips, stuff like that. So, great place to get a, a foundation in my nursing. Uh, from there, I was able to move to the Captain's Career Course in San Antonio. Uh, spent you know nine weeks there and uh, transitioned on to the ICU at Fort Campbell, uh, Blanchfield Army Community Hospital. And uh, I was given my first leadership opportunity uh, to serve as the uh, CNOIC or clinical nurse officer in charge. And uh, unlike Tripler, uh, the community hospitals, uh, much smaller. Uh, this one was six bed ICU. And instead of being ran by an intensivist, it was ran by internal med and family medicine. Um, so you, you could you could imagine that there weren't that many critical patients there. Uh, they would occasionally get critical patients, people that need to be intubated or um, uh, conscious sedation, certainly, and uh, DKA type patients. But uh, we, did, we didn't keep those patients long term. It was more like we would get them stabilized uh, to where they could be transported and they would get sent out to Vanderbilt, um, some civilian hospital in Nashville. Um, but uh, in that place, though, I, I was I was looked upon as, you know, a, a senior uh, military nurse, at least, and somebody who recently came out of uh, a place that had a lot of um, unstable patients. So going going from a, a medical center to a community hospital, you'll get looked at a lot to to share your experiences, because some of the specifically the civilian nurses that may have worked there for a very long time or didn't have very much experience uh, in a critical ICU will probably not have as much experience and, and, and need a little bit more help or guidance uh, in those smaller community hospitals. Not true for everyone, but uh, for a lot of them, it, it was. And so it, it was really cool to be to be looked at as an SME uh, for the nursing aspect of intensive care. And uh, and you really have a um, a say at the table for rounds because they, they lean on your expertise in, in these smaller MTFs. Uh, so that, that was a really cool thing. Uh, and then additional, you know, to just occasionally work on the floor whenever I was needed. Uh, the leadership opportunity there was just uh, phenomenal. I think I had 18 nurses uh, that worked for me, uh, only two military and the other 16 were civilian uh, to include LPNs, techs, um, our, our person who input all the orders as well as uh, RNs. Uh, so very, very great learning experience to, to learn how to manage civilians. If you've never done it um, in the GS system, it is a both a, a challenge and uh, something that can also be rewarding as well. So uh, helping helping previous nurses or nurses that I've worked with uh, there before ask me for letters of recommendation uh, since I've left and stuff. Really cool, really really great. Uh, but at the same time, learning how the Army hires people, how slow the bureaucratic tape can be. Uh, some of you guys who've worked in these places can can truly understand. And then learning a lot about, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, unions, yeah. Learning about unions and how to uh, properly do counselings and to, to back up everything you say with uh, policies, SOPs, and, and the counsellings that say you either did or didn't do some. So learned a lot about mid-level management uh, in that duty location. Uh, I, I was able to... Oh, oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Interrupt well, anytime. I was, and, and, uh, 
I was just going to, because you gave us a lot there, um, I definitely have several questions about where um, where we're at at this point in your career. Sure. Um, I know we still have more to cover, um, but just to kind of talk about your experience at Fort Campbell, um, did you feel like that was um, the most growth um, that you had as a leader? Because you not only um, were now the CNOIC, which is, you know, um, for those who aren't in the military, is the nurse manager. Um, you know, so you're not only managing, but then also, at, am I... Am I correct in saying, you know, so there, since it's a smaller ICU, there might be less resources. What did you do when you needed, you know, when you came across a situation where at Tripler you had all those resources available, but at Fort Campbell, um, I'm sure, you know, sometimes those resources were scarce just because it's a community hospital. So how, how did you approach those situations and how did that help you as a leader? Oh, definitely. So a uh, two part question here. So growth as a leader, definitely the most growth I've had as far as uh, military goes. Uh, and, I, and I say growth is in it's your first time to really be in charge, you know, before from from lieutenant through, you know, mid level captain, it was just you show up, you did your job, you hopefully did a good job, you might have been the may have been the lead on a small committee, maybe a PI project. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to be a, a chair of the nurse practice council at Tripler. Uh, but outside of that, you know, it was just you you followed orders and you did, you know, you just showed up and did your job. Uh, coming into Fort Campbell, though, that, that definitely was my first time uh, managing personnel. Uh, so in that sense, definitely a big, big step from the from the leadership realm. You know, it's it's one thing to, to know your job and know it well. It's another thing to try and get others on board to know their job, know it well and follow policies at the same time. Um, so definitely a huge learning curve, uh, big things that, that helped me along the way, as far as that growth went was to really lean on, uh, uh, peers and civilians that, that already worked there for longer than me, or people that I knew ahead of me that had done the job before and reached out to them to say, what does a good counseling look like? How do you deal with uh, troublesome, you know, employees, somebody didn't want to show up on time or. Um, you know, what's what's a, a good way to get somebody a raise because they're doing such a good job. You know, those those are all things you don't know going into it. And uh, while while the Army does send you to an OIC course, you know, how much can you really learn in a week and a half to two weeks compared to, you know, the three years, two years that you're going to be in that position? You do learn a little bit. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of it's uh, OJT and, and relying on your peers and and, uh, you know, mentors that have gone before you and really. Uh, seeking seeking out the assistance uh, so networking was huge very huge in that aspect uh, to grow there uh, from the clinical aspect though uh, you're right there are very limited resources uh, uh, the knowledge gaps were were a little evident not not necessarily from the physician side um, although there were some uh, whenever you're comparing a, an intensivist or critical care doc or pulmonologist to a family medicine doc i mean it, it's obvious that they they don't have the same training and then go through the same type of fellowship uh, in which they would really rely on us to, you know, from things of the size of an ET tube to how deep you should put it to, uh, you know, what's a good vasoactive medicine that'll get this person stable long enough to get them transported out. Um, so these are, you know, both knowledge um, from, from our aspect to make these recommendations or just to, they would typically make a good recommendation too. And, we just ask if we concur, you know, not not too often do they say, hey, nurse, do you concur? Because I really value your opinion. Uh, so it was, in that aspect, it, it was you're, you're looked at as more of a uh, a peer or an SME in your field. And, you know, and that's pretty empowering because they really trust your judgment. And, uh, or at least that was that was the case for me and um, really valued your opinion. So, yeah, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, so it looks before, oh, go ahead. Before, go ahead, before I jump into can, the comments, um, yeah. Brandon, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, so first, I have to say, do, do you remember her recount of our last one? And I said I wasn't there for that. And then she said, "Our go is let's go," but she right, actually right, said, right. "Let's do this." <laughs> 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 okay, for, yeah. for our viewers out there, we're talking about our cue sign for the intro. Apparently, I said we're going to say let's go. 
and we said, let's do this instead. Tomato, tomato. We are just amped up and excited to be here All right. um, I, I, and ready to yeah. celebrate Nurses Week. I see a question from uh, from uh, Eric Mucci, who was also yes. there with me at the time. So he's asking what I learned about acquisitions process and remodeling. Uh, so, because I was uh, very, uh, very involved in the transformation of the ICU there. Um, yes, with, with we people left like, comments. Yeah, there people like Eric and um, at the time was Captain Graybill were always calling me uh, to ask about how the process was going. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I couldn't believe how much power they gave just a mid-level captain to, to make a lot of these decisions because uh, somebody flew in from Texas every few months and asked me what I wanted the ICU to look like, like literally with the plans, uh, you know, a, a limited budget, uh, but was saying, hey, these are these are the guidelines from your hospital. Um, what do you want it to look like? And I was like, no one's ever asked me and I'm not prepared to to be a, uh, you know, the, the person making these huge decisions. But uh, I certainly, uh, certainly made my suggestions. And the next time he came out, he had a whole draft of all these uh, great, you know, pillars for the ICU and, and swinging monitors and uh, foldable doors and, and nurses stations on the outside and the inside. These suggestions that I made and all of a sudden they're, they're drafting them for a real, you know, to put them in the, to real life hospital build. So I was like, man, it's, it's crazy that, that they let me uh, make some of those decisions. So have they um, since built yeah. that hospital and used your suggestions? So so it's it, since I it, since I left. So uh, uh, Muchi would have a much better answer, uh, but I, but I know that it is finished. But I don't know what the final product uh, actually turned into. I know we so got you, those foldable collapsible doors though that I did ask for, and I think we got some outpatient or some outside nurses stations too, which was kind of nice. So you had a hand in and what the end result was. That's pretty cool. Yeah, right. I was a CNOIC, but of a primary care clinic. And I was a pretty new captain and I was also very um, surprised and just kind of every day was a new adventure, honestly. Um, just learning, you know, everything with CPAC and hiring actions and, yeah. and um, you know, I mean, I came up with all these different tools, you know, to rate people, to, you know, to give them um, a rating skill when interviewing them. And it was just very um, interesting, um, and always learn something new every single day. But that truly was probably, like you said, my biggest growth, Definitely. um, as a leader. And I feel like it really prepared me for future roles as well. So, um, I definitely yeah. can relate to that. Um, not on the IC level, but just being a senior. Yeah. If you can manage civilians, soldiering is, is pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. I 100% agree. Yeah. Um, okay, so it looks like he said it looks amazing and the virtual ICU starts next month. Can you tell us what a virtual ICU is? All right, so uh, from my understanding, this was, uh, I think, uh, one of the plans as well. Uh, because it's a community hospital, they, they don't necessarily staff intensivists all the time. We, we just don't have enough. We don't have the, the acuity level to, to justify, you know, having, uh, you know, hiring four to five intensivists to staff it 24 seven, you know, days, nights, weekends, all that. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's basically to have an intensivist or a pulmonologist, someone with critical care background on call 24 seven virtually uh, to assist our providers uh, in making some of these more complicated uh, or acutely ill patients uh, manage their care appropriately. So we're not sending every single patient to Vanderbilt and, you know, keeping some of those costs internal as opposed to, uh, you know, paying them out. Uh, so that that's my understanding of it. I think, uh, Erica, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's my understanding of the virtual ICU there at Fort Campbell. It makes sense. And it sounds like a good capability um, yeah. that we could have. Okay. So um, we want to just say a quick note to all of our viewers out there. Um, if you would like to share why you serve as a nurse, sorry, Brandon, I clicked at the same time you did. Definitely share your comments and questions and why you share. I know I double clicked. I'm going to pull up uh, this comment from Carrie. Um, they said they were in the medical field when they were in the Navy back in the 90s and got out in 1995. Thank you so much for tuning in and for your comments. Yeah. Um, so 
we got it to the point of you being at Fort Campbell. Was that right before CGSC, or did you have one more assignment prior to that? Oh, so actually, I had a couple. Um, oh, uh, okay. So yeah, if you no, wanted so, this, um, so give us in, a little bit more um, yeah. information, and then we're going to start asking you some questions about deployments and, yeah, and ICU please. nurse capabilities and all of that. Great. So uh, Fort Campbell, man, my time at Fort Campbell was one of explosive growth. And, I'm, and I mean that to say I had so many opportunities uh, present themselves to me. Uh, some of it was back in the old system when you had a uh, what they call the branch manager. Now I think it's their career, career coach. Uh, but um, the branch manager called me one day and was a, a former OIC of mine that, that was my boss. Uh, called me from HRC uh, and said, hey, there's a position in the White House that, that just came open. Would you be interested? Uh, I need to know by tomorrow. You know, one of those kind of questions. Um, so thought about it real quick, you know, not one of those things that you necessarily want to, I'd ever really thought about, but uh, decided not to waste the opportunity. So I applied and uh, got, got selected for the interview process. So ended up going to the executive building in DC, going to the White House and doing the interview. Unfortunately, I wasn't selected and I say, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I uh, was not selected for the uh, ICU White House nurse, but there are positions available for those that are interested. Uh, for both ICU and ER, and it spans um, Army, Navy, and Air Force, and there's PA positions as well as physicians, of course, and uh, and uh, medics, just so everyone's aware. I wasn't selected. Uh, totally fine, was okay with that. Didn't necessarily want to live in D.C. I mean, I'd only been at Fort Campbell for a year at that point. Uh, so I come back to Fort Campbell after that TDY, and the same uh, HR manager called me and said, hey, did you get the job at the White House? And I was like, oh, no, unfortunately I didn't, but but you know, I'm okay with that. And he's like, great, I'm really glad you didn't get it. And I was like, oh, that's surprising to hear since you were the one that nominated me. And they're like, no, no, uh, there's this company command gig right down the road at the 86 cash. And uh, I want you to apply for it because uh, they need somebody like you there. I was like, oh, oh, well, this is two major you know, things that weren't necessarily on my radar back to back. I was like, uh, well, okay. Hey, and he's like, well, your interview's tomorrow. Um, I already called the, the 06, uh, Colonel Zabinski, and, and uh, he wants to see you. I already told him that you'd be interested if you didn't get this job. And I was like, well, okay. So uh, I go over to what was at the time the 86 cash, uh, met with Colonel Zabinski, you know, and he's like, hey, I want you to either want to do this job or not. I'd rather not have anyone than want someone that doesn't really want to do it. I like, hey, sir, I'll, I've always wanted to do command. I think this would be a great opportunity. And uh, um, yeah, let's, I'll give it a shot. And he, he, you know, appreciated my uh, my candid feedback and uh, was was good with uh, my credentialing, at least, and having worked as an ICU nurse and as the OIC. So uh, felt OK for me to take command. And uh, I was able to uh, interview it on Friday. And then we unfurled the guide on because we converted from the 86 cash to the 531st Hospital Center and um, 586 Field Hospital on that Monday. So it was, uh, you know, Truly a head turner, uh, very fast, happened very quickly. It was literally, you know, back from a TDY and then in command the very next week. And so got a, got a huge introduction to Forcecom, to the TDA side, uh, to learning about soldiering and soldier skills and property accountability and how to do things like USRs and, and training meetings and everything that you've never heard of. In medcom because we don't have to worry about that we worry about patient care we worry about clinics we worry about how to do you know a uh, good train up for our lpns and medics and stuff like that but now i'm thrown into the command and it was really excited about it and uh, was truly truly another great amazing growing opportunity um to be on the force comp side of the house uh was led by uh at the time lieutenant colonel brian friedline uh now he's 06 Colonel Friedline, who's the DCA at Blanchfield, still there, uh, but he was the field hospital commander at the time. Colonel Pretlow was the hospital center commander, all new. So um, the, at least new to the new to the transition, at least from the 86 cash to the to the 586 field hospital and 531st hospital center. So in that, you know, I'd, I'd gotten a first sergeant. I had a company of or a detachment, at least of 66 people. Uh, at the time, it was when we were still profist. So I had 33 organic enlisted soldiers and 33 profis, which eventually became MAP as we now know it, uh, MTO assigned personnel, 
was able to go through that rollout where, you know, they were all of a sudden sending me lead forms or asking me what to do because, you know, it was very confusing at the time of Pro Piston Map when that rollout happened. Uh, but again, great, great learning experience there. We did a lot of firsts as far as, uh, you know, it was one of the first conversions from hospital center, or excuse me, from cash to, to hospital center. I think we were like third. Uh, but we were one of the first ones to actually take our stuff to the field. We realized that the doctrine that they'd sent out was incorrect. We were making these suggestions to make sure that they updated their doctrine um, on, you know, like distance of, you know, between tent to tent. So that way you're uh, supporting um, hallways with it, you know, like all these growing pains of things they had on AutoCAD that was laid out that ne wasn't necessarily correct, but we actually got to take it to the field, play with it a lot, run some patients through and, and see what work and then make suggestions to the army to, you know, better improve their product on how other hospital centers could roll out their field hospital conversion. So very interesting, very fun time, a lot of new stuff, a lot of writing. Um, and I say writing is in all these AAR comments and suggestions and long white papers on why we think it would be better to do this than that. Uh, we compared the dual hattedness of all the field hospital commanders at the time. And I say dual hattedness as in, I served as the ICU nurse for, for the field hospital, but the commander for garrison, you know, so those, those were a bunch of growing pains and that's still being worked through the process on the dual headed part. But, you know, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of them asking us how it was going and, and us being able to respond. All right. So one more piece about Fort Campbell, um, cause a, a lot happened in one year in the ICU at the, as a CNO SE one year or 14 months in command. And then uh, I got asked to go to Kosovo um, with they, the 528 or excuse me, uh, 586 was tapped to send a medical task force to Kosovo for a peacekeeping mission, along with a, a National Guard unit, which happened to be the 44th um, IBCT out of New Jersey. Uh, so National Guard unit deploying, but an active duty medical component to augment. Um, so I was asked to, to be the commander for that uh medical task force, which was a really, really awesome experience. Um, and I say that to, to learn again, more learning, tons of learning about the deployment process, how to get ready your command supply discipline program, your deployment programs, all your UMO, hazmat, air railroad, uh, hazard course, UMO, all these things to, to make sure that your stuff is prepared, your people are prepared, you have a DMD, you do these things called road to wars. Uh, just to get your team ready to make sure they have all the adequate training to make sure that they're validated, prepared. We got this great team. We, we ended up going to Kosovo, support this great mission where the piece of, people of Kosovo actually really love us. Um, they want our pictures. They want our patches. You know, the kids will come up and hug you in the middle of the street. Super fun compared to other places that you could go. Um, and for me personally, it was great to uh, uh, get a full staff, uh, you know, S1 through S6, uh, support personnel I had an XO I had a first sergeant and I had a, a host of clinical staff to include ER physicians ER nurses um, a physical therapist a dentist uh, laboratory uh, radiology all these things that that were at our disposable because we were the medical task force for the area to serve about 5500 people so in that sense it was very very cool uh, very great experience great great learning and again um, Another another time in command, you know, was was just great. And then one final part about I said last time was the final, but the last the last tail end of uh, Fort Campbell, we get back from Kosovo, and uh, it was March of 2020. We didn't actually know if we were going to make it back. The stop move was on the horizon. We had already heard that countries were going to lock us out, so we had to find additional ways to fly into the United States. Long story short, we got to the United States, we started our ROM, and as soon as we started, uh, the field hospital got tapped to uh, go to the Javits Center in New York to be the medical task force for uh, all the COVID response in New York. So while I was still, you know, doing my uh, ROM in, uh, in my house, uh, they tapped me and like, hey, I know you had all this great post-deployment leave, you know, to spend time with your family, but since we're leaving, we need you to also serve as the rear D uh, commander for the hos field hospital. So uh, we'll we'll promise we'll give you your leave back, but currently you can't go anywhere anyways because of COVID. So we just need you to stay behind and take care of all these administrative actions that we also left behind uh, for a reason. So I uh, got really, really good at army separation process and uh, 
you know, in the, in the four months that they were gone, I think we chaptered like 15 people or something like that, but uh, a really, really great experience in uh, separations, but I'll pause here, you know, for, that was just my, my experience at Fort Campbell. You can see tons and tons of uh, different growth and opportunity uh, spots from OIC to detachment command of a surgical detachment to the Kosovo deployment with a medical task force to being a rear D commander while the unit was uh, doing the COVID response. So I'll pause here for some questions. Okay. So I have um, one question about Kosovo. Oh yeah. And um, my question would be, um, can you think of a story or a moment um, that stands out from your time in Kosovo of an experience that you had either with your team or just the interaction of with the people at Kosovo? Just because you kind of talked about your experience of being commander and having like a great staff, but I want you to kind of paint a picture to our viewers of what it was actually like. And oh, what, perfect, yeah, great question. Okay, so from an ICU perspective, not very much. Um, uh, but I wasn't there as an ICU nurse; I was there as a commander. That we didn't have an ICU, we didn't have surgeons, we didn't have uh, that capability. Uh, but from from great experiences, what we did do was with our medical task force. Uh, we actually did an international medical symposium. Uh, so think of it as kind of like a TED talk um, for over 100 physicians in the area. And I say the area, I mean the area spanning 400 miles. Like p international physicians knew that Americans were in town. They were going to be doing, you know, uh, medical um, presentations. And we also invited them, um, being Kosovo physicians, to also present to us. So we did a really great, uh, I think it was nearly six hours of presentations that spanned from, you know, our ER physicians speaking on, on things like sepsis and trauma. Uh, we had a, a dental lecture. We had a physical therapy lecture. We had a, a behavior health lecture. Uh, some of the uh, uh, Kosovar uh, surgeons gave uh, some lectures on things like uh, surgical site infections and, and, and ways to prevent it. Uh, some some had to do with upcoming technology uh, that, you know, I say upcoming things that Americans were doing that the Kosovar could adopt and then they would ask us questions on it. Um, so it was it was a really, really big collaboration. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't necessarily taking care of all these sick people. Um, we were there as peacekeepers. You know, there wasn't fighting going on and there's hasn't been in over 20 years. So we were, you know, collaborators. We worked with EMS. We worked with the fire department. We worked with the police doing, you know, things like ACLS and BLS recertification. Uh, so it, it was a really, really great way to get the American brand, the U.S. Army, and, uh, you know, goodwill and medicine all out in um, in a very uh, collegial manner with, with people that were already there and willing to listen. So really, really great experience there. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. We're going to bring up a couple comments that we had come in. Brandon, if you want to pull those up for us. Sure. So Carrie came back uh, and said that it sounds like a, a virtual IC, ICU would be used in cloud computing, which I actually laughed out loud at uh, when I read it because I was just thinking about paying $5.99 for like the cloud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, in a sense, it does, because um, over, over the virtual thing, you're sending things like all the labs, the EKGs, their current trends, their vital signs. You know, they're really able to pull up their electronic medical records um, so, so that they can, on the other side of the computer, see everything that's going on. And yeah, essentially cloud based. Yep. So that's and that's exactly what. Uh, yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Uh, right. I see now. <laughs> um, and so we actually have a, a good question here. So it says, uh, Jorge says, Major Carter, uh, Staff Sergeant Alkalade, if I messed that up, I apologize. Here, I got accepted into the ACP program, which I'll be starting this summer. What do you think made you stand out for your selection to major? Uh, being enlist enlisted, remember, the career progression path for an officer or an army nurse is unclear to me. I have read the regulation of officer career progression, but I know each uh, branch is different. Awesome. So I'm assuming you're a, I, I could be wrong if you're army AEC, enlist, right. Army, uh, army enlisted, enlisted commissioning. commissioning program. Yep. I assume that's going to be a nurse. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, so 
congratulations, a uh, really big accomplishment. I've actually helped uh, mentor a few soldiers down this path as well, because I think it's great. It's one of the only programs where you're still active duty while you're in school. So those years count towards your retirement. Really great compared to taking a break in service and then, you know, doing your two to four years and then coming back in, which there's difficulties with that as well. But so still active duty, you're getting your time and you're getting paid. So awesome. Congrats. And so, all right. So what made me stand out? Um, the, the broadening opportunities, really. Uh, and I and I don't mean to say that, you know, not everybody gets picked up to major. I think our selection rate was around 75 percent. So three and four so that's pretty, pretty decent selection rate. Uh, but outside of that, what what puts you in the you know, the, the top 10, top 15, 20% are just uh, seeking out those additional leadership opportunities uh, as they come. Uh, I'm not one to say no to many things, uh, but I do would like, I, I will say that I would care, carefully weigh them. Uh, and so when the White House opportunity came up, yes, sure, I will definitely try. Um, didn't get selected. That was okay. I, another opportunity came up uh, for command and that, that ended up working out very well for me. Um, so Doing things, uh, first, clinical. your clinical base is, is vital, knowing that people can trust you, knowing that your decision-making skills are on par or better than your peers, of course, and uh, that, you know, if given extra responsibility, that, that you could carry that out. Uh, your, your rater, you know, they, they talk about your performance and how well you did in your job, but then your senior rater says, this person either does or does not have potential to advance in their career. And uh, it's really, you know, in the eyes of the senior rater, uh, how well they think you'll do. And so uh, it'll, it'll be up to you and you, your conversations with your senior rater on how you want to shape your career path. Some people like to stay strictly clinical and you can make major and stay, uh, at least through the ICU realm, uh, clinical all the way to the bedside through major um, uh, to go in place like the burn ICU in um, Fort Sam Houston, where majors work the floor. You wouldn't see a major necessarily work in the floor in most other places uh, because there's just an excess of captains. But uh, in other places, there there are majors that regularly work the floor like the, the ISR because they need that real sharp clinical background and, and people that already have the experience, not new to ICU nursing and in places like the burn unit. Um, so shaping your shaping your future is a huge piece on uh, on on how you get picked up. So, you know, right now I'm on the, you know, force comm fast track, I guess you could call it. And, and I mean to say that by, you know, this is my third command. Um, so it's obvious that I'm, I'm not a stranger to take it on, you know, increased roles of responsibility, I guess is what you would call it. And, and to do well in those kind of jobs. So obviously it's important that, that your performance does well too. Um, so as far as uh, the regulations about officer career progression, um, for on the officer side, at least for nurses, you get two looks, you get a, well, potentially three, you get a below the zone look, uh, and that's, uh, for captains, uh, captains on up to colonel. Your below the zone is, uh, typically limited to one or two, uh, depending on the, the needs of the army, potentially zero. I've seen those before too, where zero people got picked up for below the zone, but typically it's one, maybe two nurses per year. And you're talking out of a cohort of greater than 300. Uh, so if you're the number one or two nurse and you got picked up easy, you probably know that you're, you're all that you're pretty good. Uh, I've never got picked up easy, uh, but, I, but I've been progressing in my career just fine. Um, so you're, you're in the zone. Look, uh, starting a captain that's, that's right at your four year mark. Uh, you'll, you'll find that you'll go to the board at your three year mark. You'll, you'll know you're promotable for about a year or, you know, six to eight months at least. Um, then you'll, you'll pick up captain and, be captain for six years, what seems like forever. Um, and same thing, you'll go to the BZ board and, uh, you know, if you're the number one or two, you'll get picked up BZ. If not, you'll pick up primary with the, everyone else. Um, so typically what I tell uh, captains that are, you know, going before their board is don't get a DUI, don't bust uh, ABCP or, or, you know, height weight and um, don't fail your PT test. If you can you can not do those three things i would say you have a 90 percent chance of getting picked up um because the ones that don't typically are either unfortunately overweight according to our standards or they're they're in some sort of legal trouble um natural that, selection that, right right and that, that <laughs> obviously uh hold them back uh or you know but formally now the da photo is not a thing but 
you just had a really crappy DA po photo in the past where your ribbons were upside down or you didn't have one all together, you know, it's a clear indicator to the board that this person is not ready for increased responsibility if they can't even get something simple right. So my, my biggest advice is uh, do the small things right and do them all well every time. And if you do that, then you'll, you know, at least be in the 50th percentile and that'll be enough to get you picked up. And I know that doesn't sound like much or like it's like great wisdom, but um, you know, with, with a pickup rate of 75 to 80%, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty good. And, and I speak strictly for the active duty side, because I know the reserve unit has a, a lot of different challenges, uh, uh, with promotions and, and how many they're taking in, but the active duty side, we're definitely, um, hurting for ICU nurses. If you guys didn't know bonuses are way up. Um, they went up over 40%, I think, uh, two years ago from, from 20,000 for four years to 35,000 for six years. And I say 35,000, I think that's 35, 36 every year, mm -hmm. you know, that's a huge bonus, um, to compete both on the outside and to, to make you relevant. And we're also starting to take reserve nurses and making them active duty nurses. Uh, if you guys haven't heard that before, because we're not filling our numbers. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, just a slight correction with the army, army reserve. It's, well, it's 25, per year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was speaking strictly for active duty. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the, the incentives work a little bit differently, but I believe, and I actually was surprised when the newest incentives came out uh, back in October, but 66 Sierra was one of the only nurses that had a bonus and it was right up there. It's either 25 or 30. I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, I do have a, I have a question for you. So you joined as a med surge nurse correct? I did. Yeah. Every, well, anyone who comes out of ROTC pretty much always gets a 66 okay. hotel slot. Right. So, uh, with what we do, we have, we rarely recruit or have a mission to bring 66 hotel med surge nurse on, um, because they majority come out of either ACP or ROTC. Right. So we have a program where if you're a med surge nurse on the civilian side, and want to become an ICU nurse, you can come into the student program, uh, the student program, and go directly into ICU, uh, the ICU course. Can you speak a little bit on your experience and what you learned in at the ICU course? Oh yeah, so the ICU course, um, it's either famous or infamous, uh, depending on uh, your your ability. Excuse me, am I? Uh, my dog's here is just really wanting to get out, and he's scratching the door. <laughs> yeah. All right, but um. My experience was it lasted right around four months because I was there over a holiday. Um, I think I started in uh, October, November timeframe, and then we mandatorily had to take a Christmas break. So we had like two weeks off um, and then and then resumed. But um, it split up into two different uh, phases, didactic, which everyone in the course, I say everyone, um, both ER and ICU nurses are um, – taking the same exact material, same time. We're all in the same class, taught by the same instructors. And uh, the instructors, by the way, phenomenal. Um, all active duty nurses, uh, most of them are have just finished or, or have been senior in um, advanced schooling. So they're all advanced registered nurses and, and some from another. Um, I think for ours, they were pretty much all clinical nurse specialists in either emergency medicine or uh, critical care medicine. So. You got some really bright people, DNPs. Uh, currently, um, if you guys didn't know, Colonel Reichert, Richard um, is the director, and she could she could probably tell you guys a lot more about it than I could, because uh, it's heck, it's almost been ten years since I've went now. But um, you do your you, the first half of the course is all didactic, and that's where you get real deep, real heavy into um, the pathophysiology of critical care. Um, so it's it's. The way I've been heard is that it's a master's level course in, in patho, basically, um, where you where you basically hit all the systems. And it takes about eight, uh, yeah, about eight weeks uh, to get through that phase, I believe, if I'm six to eight weeks, if I remember correctly. Um, test every week. Uh, they hit all the major systems and they're not easy. Uh, we had Unfortunately, there are people that do fail didactic portion. Uh, you're given a chance, I think, to make up, and if you don't do well on the on the makeup, then you're out of the course. Unfortunately, just like any other Army course, 
uh, but uh, they don't give you slack. You you really have to go in putting in the work. And uh, there's it's a TD at the time for us. It was a TDY and it was encouraged not to bring your family. They gave us a, uh, a hotel suite. Um, and by suite, I mean like a like an apartment, basically, um, for us to really go there and focus on studying. And that's that's pretty much what we did. Uh, and then at, in the midpoint of it, you do um, I think it's called the NGR. I, forgive me. I don't know if that stood for nursing grand rounds, but um, where where you're given a patient and you have to give a one hour presentation over said patient, starting with their main problem. Uh, and then you you break that problem out into into, uh, you know, a big tree bundle of you know, COPD and what, what does that mean? Impaired gas exchange. And what does that mean? And you, you break it all the way down from what their initial diagnosis or their main diagnosis is all the way to what happens at cell death. So we're taking it to that small of a detail to explain how the cells in your body die and uh, how that relates to the, you know, the patient and their outcome and what medicines we give to combat said disease. Uh, so really great. And then after that, you go into your clinical phase where you go through all your, you know, for ICU, at least we went through all the ICU floors. So you got your neuro, your medical, your surgical, we got a couple of days in burns. And then we got a couple of, um, of days in the ER as well, just to, just to get a feel for it. Um, and then after that, it was the, uh, a two hour presentation on the same thing, but in, instead of uh, one clinical problem, you had to focus on two. Again, from the uh, from the initial problem all the way to cell death. So some other people could probably answer that a little bit better than me, but that was my experience at the critical care course. Very tough, very challenging, but whenever you come out and you're able to explain why you're doing something and instead of just because that's the way it's always been done or that's how I was taught and you actually know the physiology behind it, it kind of makes you very empowered to uh, to have a seat at the table, like I'd said earlier, and your value, your opinions are valued because you understand how medications react or how they work in the body, and and it makes sense, and you can speak the same language as the physician. So, in that sense, uh, very very great experience. Awesome! I Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I appreciate that. When I was in Bullock, I ran it, or yeah, I don't know. I think it's Bullock. I ran into a nurse that I went to school with. And she was going through the ICU course and she was just telling me how amazing it was, uh, how super intense it was and uh, very, very challenging. Um, and yeah, actually, I don't know if Holly was going to pose a question. Gonna... Yeah, yeah. Perfect. All right. We're okay. on the same page. So um, I have a segue story. Um, Brandon Bello, um, he um, actually, I just got in contact with him the other day. Um, he came across my live stream video from 2020 about Army Nurse uh, 101 information, which is honestly a pretty um, awesome thing because we've been doing these live stream videos since 2020. And about once a week, I have either someone on Instagram, LinkedIn, or um, just they see my phone number or email and text or email me and ask questions because they saw the live stream I would say a lot of times they are not qualified. Um, they're just, you know, I'm planning to go to nursing school or I'm in nursing school and they're just kind of fact finding for their future. But Brandon is actually already an ICU nurse. He's working at a level one trauma center in Hawaii. And nice. um, he Queens, I in, take it. He is interested in um, applying as an ICU nurse in the reserve. He had very specific questions um, when he was reaching out, and I found a few um, SMEs for him to talk to, um, but he's really interested in FRSTs, and um, he was asking questions about ghost deployments, and, um, you know, we had a really great conversation. It's very energetic, and it's just truly, really, I mean, this all comes back to our live streams. It is a long-term uh, payoff, but, um, we have seen over time that it really is getting the word out and, um, people are coming across these, um, when they're doing their own research and then they're, they're getting a hold of us. So, um, Brandon, um, we would love for you to share your specific questions on, um, 
your um, the FRST and stuff like that. But Major Carter, if you want to just share um, what you can talk about exactly, like the opportunity of an ICU nurse in an FRST and about a ghost deployment. Oh, great. Yeah. So FRSTs in general. Um, so I, I'm fortunate enough to be the commander of the, the 10th FRST. I always like to uh, put my stuff out there if you can see it. Eh, it's kind of a little blurry. There you go. 10th FRST out of El Paso, Fort Bliss, Texas. Uh, newer unit. Uh, there were, if you guys didn't know, there were a whole host of new FRSTs or FRSDs that just stood up in the last uh, two to three years. The 10th was one of them. It's only been around for about three and a half years now, uh, where formerly um, most medical brigades had like one per location, uh, or at least one to three per location. And now there's at least three per location. And I think some of that came between the reserve side and the active side. And they, they figured that they needed a little bit more of the support on the active side than they did the reserve side. But that being said, there are a lot of FRSTs in the reserves and they get a lot of deployment time. Um, specifically speaking on ghost um, missions, typically there, there are those are connected to the special forces community. You may be lucky enough to be on an FRST that supports uh, special forces, uh, but there are specific uh, special forces medical teams or ghost teams that are out there that support only the SF community. Um, I, I can't give you the exact names of each one of them, but I know that they're out there. There's one on the active duty side that is an FRST that is connected to a civilian medical center out of, I believe it's Charlotte. It's either Charlotte or Raleigh that they, they are actually connected to the 528 sustainment brigade out of Fort Bragg that only supports SF missions. So both the sustainment brigade, and if you guys didn't know, um, medical is part of um, sustainment. We support the fighting force, right? Um, so um, we, we are tucked into the sustainment cell of the 528th Sustainment Brigade to support SF out of Bragg and work in a civilian center. Um, and I say civilian because they want us to be um, the most up to date in our task and skills. Uh, so you're always working in the trauma center as a team in the civilian centers. Um, Outside of that one specific one, I don't know too many more uh, that only support SOF. Um, there are some J JSOC opportunities out there, uh, specifically for CRNAs and um, physicians that are that are more common than than specifically just for ICU nurses because they work in such small teams. But I'm sure if you saw it hard enough, you you would be able to find one or at least network well enough to to be able to give yourself a shot at the table. Um, but specifically for ICU nursing opportunities within the FRST. Um, there, just to give you guys a, a structure, the FRST is 20 personnel. Uh, FRST stands for Forward Resuscitative Surgical Team. Um, formerly, it was called the Forward, Resuscit or Forward Surgical Team. Uh, but about three years ago or three to four years ago, they added the resuscitative piece uh, because we added an ER doc uh, into the equation and we took out the OR nurse, uh, give and take. Um, debates on on the, the good and the bad of taking out the OR nurse, but I digress and I'll just speak on the ICU piece. Um, so with these 20 people, uh, it's split into typically two teams, two teams of 10. Each team has a ortho surgeon, a trauma surgeon or a general surgeon, but typically that's trained in trauma, um, an ER physician, so that's three physicians, a CRNA, and then one ICU nurse, one ER nurse, one LPN, and one whiskey or medic. And then you also have an administrative person, which is either your XO, who's a medical service officer, or the detachment sergeant, who is typically a 68 whiskey sergeant first class type, uh, but they serve as an administrator. So those are your two 10-man teams. If you're really lucky, you'll be able to be one giant 20-person team and have a lot more resources. But the way that uh, our past wars have gone, uh, a lot of times you'll just get split, uh, you, what's called split base operations, and you'll just go out as a 10-man team. And so uh, the real important pieces here are that you're very, very clinically competent because you are the only ICU nurse on the team. Uh, you're not with an intensivist. You're not necessarily um, with someone else that knows how to work the equipment as well as you do. And by equipment, I mean uh, the ventilators, the uh, pumps, 
the the bear hugger even you know the things that physicians don't normally touch lpns if they've been on force calm the whole time and not in the hospital they may not be super familiar certainly with vents and then your medic you know medics aren't necessarily trained in ventilators either so you are the sole subject matter expert on everything icu and you're relied to uh teach and train others cross train them to to also know your job in case that you can't be there or that you need more help and that there's a lot more icu patients so the opportunities are are very great and they're they're very uh you have a lot of responsibility with these you know jobs so two slots for the icu nurse per team or excuse me um uh, per frst or frsd detachment um, they switched the name from detachment or from team to detachment because you break down into teams so it's confusing to say team and teams um, so now you are a detachment and then you're two teams from there but uh, but opportunities yeah i i was lucky enough to be selected as the commander uh for this frst that i'm on um and the the command position can literally be any of the officers on the team so the way that doctrine is written they want the lieutenant colonel surgeon to be the commander uh over time they realize that surgeons don't really care for administrative work they'd rather do surgery in the or as they're trained and paid to do um so every once in a while you will find a surgeon that is a commander but for the most part you know with all 20 something frsts out there you don't see that many surgeon commanders um so then your next person will be uh your your nurses so your crna your er nurse or your icu nurse uh, also have a chance to to go out for these command positions and when you go out for these uh, they're dual hatted meaning that um, you're in command and garrison everything uh, you know rules and regulations is your realm uh, the training is your realm um, and then in the deployed environment you're dual hatted meaning you know, when a patient comes in the door, you're no longer the commander, you're the ICU nurse and your chief surgeon, the O5 uh, lieutenant colonel is now the 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 medical chief, uh, you know, with the most medical experience and knowledge. They're everything SME medical. So what they say goes as far as this is the OR and this is how the OR will run or this is how the patient should flow through the through the uh, tent. You know, we listen to them for their experts and ex. ex expertise and guidance because they do have the medical knowledge. So just because I'm the commander doesn't mean I tell the surgeon what to do. It just means I have administrative authority over them and uh, nothing less uh, or nothing more. And it, it's, a, it's a good balance because, you know, it's, it's very collegial. We're, we're not, you know, no one, you're not supposed to be power hungry. Of course, it's, it's all about good collaboration, good teamwork. And with teams this small, you have to have that trust. You have to have that team. And, um, yeah. So the opportunities are out there. You just have to make sure to uh, position yourself uh, correctly um, and uh, make sure you, you get the, the right kind of reviews, the right kind of experience, the right kind of um, OERs to, to put yourself in a competitive position to uh, apply for command. I will say I, I was lucky enough to have the two previous commands prior to this, along with a good foundation in uh, the ICU. So, you know, with, with those three things, they, they saw that I was at least clinically and administratively competent enough to, to take a risk on. And so far it's, it's worked out well for me and I've, I've really enjoyed my time. So, um, those are the opportunities I'm aware of. Of course, there's a lot out there. And if I could give any advice on applying to the FRST, uh, one network, know, know where positions are going to become available and then don't limit yourself to one location. Um, if I'm being perfectly honest, you know, Fort Bliss wasn't the the number one place on everyone's roster to go. Um, but it was the place where there was the FRST command available and, and I applied for it and, and was able, lucky enough to get it. So I went for the job, not necessarily the location. There's also FRSTs in Germany. There's some in Korea. Um, I haven't I haven't found out if they're going to make one in Alaska yet. I would really love it if they did. That would be awesome. But, you know, Alaska is going to become a new division. Um, um, and then of course, Brad Carson, um, Campbell, you know, uh, and, uh, JBLM all have FRSTs, right? So the opportunities are out there, uh, certainly for active duty. Uh, but again, it's, it's being able to, to network well, to put yourself in the right position, to be able to apply 
And, uh, you know, as bad as it sounds, you know, you got to do your time on the floor uh, to, to make sure that, you know, that they don't want to just take a, a scrub out of the course. They can, don't get me wrong. Uh, but, but when it comes time to saving soldiers' lives, we want the most ready person and the most competent person out there to, to be the subject matter expert for, for somebody whose life might depend on it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Jorge um, also commented, um, you know, that he desired to follow the same type of career path as you um, going down the IC route in command. And you really did cover about networking and what you needed to do to be on the lookout for it. And then he also commented that he is located at Fort Bliss. So this oh, might yeah. be someone that uh, yeah. should link up with you um, maybe for some mentoring or yeah. um, I'm at Starbucks know. every morning. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, if would every it, officer said every officer, yeah. Um, Jorge, if you want me to link you up via mm -hmm. Outlook, um, you know, connect you to send me a text message on my work phone number that's scrolling below, and I'll um, I'll send you Major Carter's email, and then you can get connected with him to further the conversation if you have additional questions. Um, yeah, all right. Brandon's response. Yes. Thank you, Captain Holly, for introducing me. Major Carter, can you provide some insight on the application process um, on how it, on getting assigned into an FRSD reserve? Uh, so he specifically is interested in applying to reserve. So I've linked him okay. up with a couple people, one person in the reserve, one person active duty um, as an ICU nurse and not necessarily command. It is, is it mostly through networking and moving up? Where would you recommend starting if I go in as a reserve 66 Sierra in the upcoming year? Um, well, you could do either. Uh, but I guess one big piece of advice is as you're doing your clinical time, certainly as a hotel and, and it, once you get into the Sierra realm. Um, so at the he's, very already, he's already an ICU nurse okay, going into that the reserve right. as an ICU nurse. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely put yourself out there. Uh, but the big thing is on the bottom of your OER, it says list your next three successive positions that you hope to uh, compete for it's something along those lines, your next three successive positions, I think is what it says. And um, for for mine, before I was even in an FRST, my three previous OERs each said FRST, I want to be on an FRST, I want to be on an FRST, right, uh, as either my number one or number two choice for next position. Um, and I think that's really important because it shows it shows your future interviewer, whoever that might be, that, you know, this person isn't just wanting to go out of there all of a sudden just because, but that they've had a long-term desire to, to achieve this kind of position specifically, you know, it, not just because it sounds cool, but, you know, it's, it's more than, you know, just I thought about it one day and it sounded good. But, you know, for three years, this guy has really wanted to be on a team. He's done what it took to, to get clinically competent. He's, you know, he's came over to a unit and he shadowed an FTX maybe, um, or, you know, you just, Make sure you're getting out there to, to talk to people who are already in FRSTs. Uh, if, if you're on a, on a base uh, where, there's, where there is one or you're near one, to, to just reach out and be like, hey, can I just come observe you guys sometime and, and, and you know, learn what you do? Uh, those are great things to, to put on your future application to say, you know, I've, I've talked to these people. They can make a recommendation. I've wanted to do it for a long time. It shows right here on my OERs. You know, and I know what it takes because I, I've went out and done an FTX and this is right up my alley. It's definitely what I want to do. And it's, uh, you know, it's you really have to sell yourself, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. And and Brandon will um, definitely please contact the two people that I um, gave you the contact information for. And then if you would like additional um, SMEs to talk to, I actually had like three or at least two or three more that said they would be willing to talk to you. I just didn't want to overwhelm you with too many contacts. Oh before. yeah, totally understand. Um, but thank you so much, Major Carter, for that insight. Our commander, um, Colonel Ha, actually tuned in. Oh, um, awesome. So thank you, Colonel Ha. He said, thank you, Major Carter, for sharing your valuable experience. Great job to Captain Parham and Captain Weaver. We'll take the kudos. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, Appreciate it, sir. Go get him. We shall. Also, Brandon, you have the best name. Just saying. I'm a bit <laughs> partial, but it's whatever. Yeah. 
Um, so definitely, Brandon, I will follow up with you. Make sure you have all the resources that you need um, to seek out those opportunities. Um, he said, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. We definitely appreciate it. But Major Carter, we are five past the hour. We typically wrap these up in about an hour, but we would like to kick it back to you for just any closing comments or anything that you wanted to share that you didn't get to share before we sign off. Oh, sure. Um, first, thank you for the opportunity because it's been really great. Um, you know, I, was, I wasn't really sure what I would say on here, and uh, but I, I'm glad I got to share a little bit of my experience and hopefully uh, maybe motivated some of you guys. And specifically, if you're thinking about the FRST, FRSD is now the most of them are called. Um, definitely reach out to, to some of those people that you know, or, or, you know, a lot of times I'll just look on AIM or or the medical brigade's website to see if they have a uh, a chart of who all their commanders are. So you can just send them all emails, especially during the AIM cycle. Uh, but I will say as, as my time as a FRSD commander, uh, we've got to do a validation exercise where the brigade came down and viewed us. We ran through 30 something patients in the desert. I got to go to the Miami um, ATDD, Army Trauma Training Center and Rider Trauma Center in Miami. Got to spend two weeks down there doing nothing but trauma patients. We went through BAMPSI's ICU and BAMPSI's ER as a trauma team. Spent a week down there doing trauma patients, trauma care. We just got back from the burn unit at the ISR in San Antonio as well to make sure that we know how to take care of burn patients. Not something that most people get a lot of clinical skill on. And then um, we're going to the joint emergency medical medicine exercise at Fort Hood at the end of June or beginning of June. And then coming up on the... Um, the Starcy or, or San Antonio version of Army trauma training uh, in July. So tons going on. It's very fast paced in the FRST, uh, but you you learn a ton and you really become the the trauma professional. And and that's that's the best part about it. It's a small team. You have a lot of autonomy, but with that, a lot of responsibility to make sure that both you and your team are prepared to take care of any future casualty that you might encounter. So. Uh, if you're up for it, you, you think that you like adventure, you like you like small teams and you like to to really be relied on to be the SME, then then maybe the F FRST is for you. And uh, I would highly encourage anyone that wants to seek it out to do so. Um, again, thank you for the time. Thank you for uh, for the opportunity. And if anyone wants to reach out, um, I'm sure Holly could send out my email, but it's uh, robert.d.carter122122.mil dot mil at army.mil. There's 122 of you in the army? Uh, at, at the time, I guess so. I don't understand how I'm number 122, but that was the gift I was given. I was number one, I was number 28 whenever it was just r.carter, you know, at usarmy.mil, but that was a long, long time ago. And then I went from 28 to 122 all of a sudden. I don't understand. That's funny. Yeah. Well, we didn't get to talk about it, but I just want to wish you all the best in your Ironman training. You have a couple oh, races yeah. coming up. As um, do you. Good luck. Thank you very much. I'm not doing a full Ironman, though, only half Ironman, but um, it's nice uh, to see um, the camaraderie and um, just kind of all of us Army nurses sharing um, our motivation by getting out there and getting getting our workouts in um so definitely good luck as you approach your upcoming races and we just really want to thank you so much yeah. what are first what of is all, your first of all <laughs> objection hearsay yeah. secondly is there there's the new iron man coming out i thought he died in <laughs> it's not, okay so uh, he, very similar yeah uh <laughs> similar but not um iron man triathlon yeah. No, I only, yeah. I only go to the movies. Right. Yeah. So uh, Brandon is training by eating some popcorn while watching the movie Iron Man. Right. It comes on uh, TV too. Yeah. Yeah. Next but, time we're coming on with the helmets that like. Yeah. Yeah. Point missed. No, that's yeah. okay. Um, so yeah, just good luck. And thank you so much for all the insight that you provided to us. And um, I think it's pretty cool that we had um, a future AECP here that is actually stationed at Fort Bliss and now, you know, made that connection and um, hopefully, you know, that can be 
um, a mentoring relationship uh, that's that started from this live stream. So we appreciate yeah, you right and um, happy Nurses Week, everyone. Um, I hope everyone has a great week and just a great evening. Yeah. Thanks again. Happy Nurses Week. Thank so, you. Thank you, Major Carter. Thank you, Captain Weaver. Thank and you very much. Uh, I will see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.